Okay, I started to record. <laughs> so, God, please start. Yes, I have to click a button here, I think. Okay. Yes, so it's a pleasure for me to give this lecture uh, on, in this series of lectures, uh, which uh, Professor Betch uh, holds. And since there is a, a gap between the lecture number eight, I think this was the, the recent lecture, and the lecture number well, 10 then. In time, I was asked to fill in the gap in between, and I feel very honored to do that. And yes, I think we directly start. I have prepared some manuscript, which I share with you. And I think the best way to do it is like Mr. Professor Petsch does, just go through the manuscript and follow the lines written there. Of course, I will try to, to make some points more clear. And yes, that's the way uh, I want to do that. Another thing I want to say when I was preparing this lecture, of course, uh, I had to think about what to tell. And it was uh, quite clear for me that I didn't want to give uh, a just only a research talk or something like uh, we would talk about in a research seminar. I want to keep the general structure of this lecture, do some elementary proofs, uh, which requires elementary techniques in, in nearings. And uh, so some of the results or maybe even the majority of the results are not due to myself. They are known, but they fit well into the discussion. And of course, I also will address some results of mine uh, uh, from recent research on that topic concerning basically uh, primitive nearings. I currently work on this topic uh, of primitive nearings and yeah and hopefully i can make the point clear that studying primitive nearings even nowadays it's is not a dead end discussion it's a very vital uh, area in nearing theory where you can still prove a lot of interesting results or there still are a lot of interesting questions around. So I open my manuscript. I hope everything works. Yes, you see the, you should see the manuscript, but I have checked it with Günther beforehand. So this should work. So the topic of my talk is zero primitive nearings, minimal, minimal ideals and simple nearings. And before we go deeper into the discussion, I want to recall some basic definitions which have been given, of course, by Professor Betsch. Uh, but I think it's good to recall them. One thing which is different to Professor Betsch nearings lecture is we consider right nearings, but this is not a serious uh, point here and should not cause any troubles. So we don't have the right distributive, distributive law and not the left one. So, okay, we let's uh, run quickly through the definitions. We have an N group and an N ideal of the N group is a normal subgroup. And then we have this property. Where this property comes from, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, that's the standard definition. Then we have, uh, uh, note that if you have the left distributivity law, then this would be just the usual notion of an N subgroup in a ring. Uh, a left ideal of a nearing N is then is then an N ideal of the natural N group N. The additive group of the nearing always is a left ideal. And in case N is zero symmetric, it's easy to see that left ideals are closed with respect to multiplication from the left-hand side which makes them an n-group. 
The left ideal is an ideal if we have the multiplication from the right hand side stays within the ideal. Remember, we are using right nearings here, otherwise, we would require from the multiplication from the left hand side to stay in the ideal. Now we have the different uh, n groups of type 0, type 1, and type 2, which have been introduced by Professor Petsch, but we we'll shortly recall the definition here. Type 0 means we have a generator, uh, and then no non trivial n ideals in gamma. That's the most basic definition. Type 1 is type 0. And then we have a so-called strongly monogenic action. I think this definition stems from Mr. Betch himself originally. And what does this mean? This means that uh, the nearing acts on, the, on a non-generator in that way that n times the non-generator always gives zero. It's a specification of uh, type zero in group. Okay, now what is an n subgroup? It's a subgroup of the n group gamma, which is closed under multiplication from the left hand side. What is an n group of type two? An n group of type two basically is an n group where we do not have any non-trivial n subgroups. These n groups of type 2 have been studied by Professor Betch in the nearing lecture number 8, where he discussed the density theorem for two primitive nearings with identity. Uh, two primitive nearing means that the nearing acts on an n group of type 2 in a faithful way. What does faithful mean? Whenever you have an n group and some subset of the n group, then we have a so called annihilator. That's this set. It's not only a set, it is more than a set. It is a left ideal of the nearing. It's easy to show. And in case the n group has only the zero element, only the zero element of the nearing annihilates the n group, then we call an n group faithful. And here we have, we have the definition of a zero primitive nearing. If the nearing acts faithfully on some n group of type V. And you have studied the two primitive nearings with identity more closely. The last lecture, and there are also the nearings, uh, primitive nearings of type one, one primitive nearings, and also there are the zero primitive nearings. And in theory of primitive nearings, there are two major cornerstones, so to say. The one is the density theorem for two primitive nearings with identity, and the other one is the interpolation theorem on non-generators, which holds in zero primitive nearings, uh, which was proven in the lecture as far as I know, it was in lecture number seven. What uh, we do not have is some nice theorem for zero primitive nearings, density theorem, as, it, as we, we have for two primitive nearings with identity. You know, these two primitive nearings with identity, they are so-called centralized nearings and can be completely described with the help of groups and fixed point free automorphism groups. Now, uh, why should it be interesting to study zero primitive nearings or to study one primitive nearings more closely? Of course, you can say it is interesting in its own right, because there are still open questions. We do not have something like a density theorem for this type of structures, and we want to establish results. But there is more to it. There is, to my opinion, more reason to study zero primitive nearings than only to study them in their own right, because they have 
some interesting and important connections to general structure theory in nearings. Namely, and this is what I want to show you in this section number two in this lecture, we have a connection between uh, zero primitive nearings and subdirectly irreducible nearings. Uh, and I want to establish this connection. It, uh, as far as I know, it should be known. So these are not original results due to myself, but I will bring in, I guess, some new ideas here. So we start with a lemma. And at this point, I have to look a little bit uh, concerning the time, but I think at the moment there's still enough time available. So I will do the proof here. And if I see that I run out of time at the end, yes, we have to maybe skip some proofs at the end. But this is a short one and also an interesting one, I think. So if you have a zero symmetric nearing and an ideal of this nearing, then we let gamma to be an n group of type zero. And we don't we want to have a zero intersection between the annihilator of the n group and the ideal. This would, of course, naturally be the case if the n group of type zero is a faithful n group because then the annihilator itself is already zero. So especially this lemma holds in zero primitive nearings. Uh, and what does, what's the point here? Whenever we have a generator of the n group with respect to the nearing, this generator will also be a generator with respect to the ideal of the nearing. And note that uh, in a zero primitive nearing, and we will have an example later on, there can be ideals. It's not the case as in ring theory where the primitive nearings are simple, at least if they have a finiteness condition. In zero primitive nearings, we usually find ideals. So, okay, we assume we have this generator and let's assume that the ideal kills this generator, then we consider this equation i times gamma is the same as i times n gamma, n gamma is the whole group, it's a generator. And since i is an ideal, i n stays in i, and by assumption we have like I'm at zero, this means i of the whole group is zero, contradicting the fact that we should have the zero intersection here, the annihilator. Now, since we have that gamma is a generator, uh, it's easy to see that i times gamma is an n ideal in gamma. And by assumption, we have an n group of type zero, which means there should not be any non-trivial n ideals. We know that i times gamma cannot be zero. So on the other hand, i times gamma has to be gamma itself which shows that a generator with, with respect to n is also a generator with respect to the ideal i. And so we can also already prove one of the first results here. If we have a zero primitive nearing, then this zero primitive nearing is subdirectly irreducible. Just to recall what does subdirectly irreducible mean, I haven't put the uh, definition here. This means we have precisely uh, one uh, minimal ideal. And yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. And here we have, in order to guarantee minimal ideals at all, I have to assume that this is the i, the descending chain condition on ideals of the nearing. And we suppose the nearing is primitive, acting on some n group gamma, and then, as I already announced, it should be subdirectly irreducible. And H, this is the minimal ideal, then the unique minimal ideal uh, has the property that here H to the power of 2 is not 
equal to zero was, what does this mean? This means we do not have zero multiplication on this minimum material H. Okay, so let's jump into the proof. Still, there is time enough to do that. It's not such a long proof. So by the DCCI, as I already mentioned, we get at least one minimal ideal I1. And now we suppose this minimal ideal is not unique, which means there's a second minimal ideal I2. Now by minimality of these two ideals, we require I2 to be different to I1. We must have that they have zero intersection, follows directly from the minimality of the ideals. Now, if we have a direct, uh, if we have an intersection zero and we have two ideals, then also the product of the two ideals uh, must be zero because I1 times I2 is contained in the intersection, which is easy to see. Okay, now let's take, let's take a generator of the N group gamma and we have that the nearing is uh, zero primitive, we have that the annihilator is zero, which means that the intersection I1 with the annihilator is zero, also the intersection I2 with the annihilator is zero, and then we can apply the lemma we have just proven and see that both ideals generate the N group gamma. What does this mean? This means there is some I2 in the ideal I2 such that you know, I2 of gamma uh, is gamma. This follows from, from here. Yeah? Okay. But then we multiply with I1, left hand side. And since we have already established that I1 times I2 is zero, this here is zero. I1 times gamma is zero, and uh, this is a, a contradiction. And yeah, hence we have that N is subdirectly irreducible. Remember, I1 times gamma has to be gamma, not zero. Okay. So, Thus, yeah, we have the unique minimum ideal I1. Now suppose this is an extra result here, but we need this result later. Uh, suppose we have zero multiplication on the ideal. This would imply, since I1 generates the N group gamma, this would imply that I1 times gamma, which is equal to I1, I1 gamma is zero and faithfulness of gamma forbids that we have a contradiction. So, and we have seen that in case of zero primitive nearings with DCCI, we find that these zero primitive nearings, they are subdirectly irreducible. The minimal ideal, the unique one, is, uh, has non-zero uh, multiplication. Now, the next question of interest is when we are talking about uh, zero primitive nearings, we always assume we have some n group of type zero. But of course, you can ask the question, given a nearing n, from where do we take n groups of gamma at all? Where do they come from? And we will see in the next lemma, next proposition, that a source, a natural source, for n groups of type zero in an in a nearing are minimal left ideals. I've put a remark here. Uh, not each n group of type zero of a nearing shows up as a minimal left ideal. No, that's not the point here. We just found find one source of minimal left ideals. These are minimal left ideals. So the next proposition, I just uh, mention it quickly and skip a thorough proof of it. 
uh, if you have a zero symmetric nearing with DCCN, which means that the, the, the sending chain condition of N subgroups contained in N. And suppose, uh, yeah, here something is missing. This the assumption, this L is a left ideal here. Okay. Suppose we have uh, an N group which is contained uh, in this left ideal, and this N group M should be properly uh, contained in this left ideal, then we cannot have that, that L and M are in isomorphic. Why is this the case? Um, just uh, think of it. Suppose that this N subgroup M, which sits in L, would be N isomorphic to L, then by N isomorphism, also M would have the same property and there would be another N subgroup properly sitting in M, which I call M1. And from that, you can establish a decreasing chain of N subgroups. They're all N isomorphic and they decrease, infinite decreasing chain. Such structures uh, really exist exist. Yeah. So indeed there exist nearings which have a left ideal and inside uh, the left ideal they properly sit an N subgroup which is N isomorphic to the left ideal and then this nearing has an infinite decreasing chain of uh, N subgroups. These are examples of nearings which do not have TCCN. Such structures do exist but I do not talk about them more closely. Here would have been the, the exact proof for, of this fact, uh, but uh, I skipped that. Okay. The next lemma is of importance for us, and let's see how far or how detailed I will be uh, for giving this proof but at least I will give some parts of it. Now, suppose we have a zero symmetric nearing and we have a minimal left ideal, which has not zero multiplication. And here we have this lengthy assumption. Suppose that L, this minimal left ideal, does not contain N subgroups, which are properly contained in L and being N isomorphic to L. I know this sounds a little bit strange, but for example, this naturally holds, as I just pointed it out, in nearing with uh, descending chain condition with TCCN, or for example, in finite nearings, this can never happen. Okay. Then this minimal left ideal contains a multiplicative right identity, E, and considered as subnearing of N and what is of importance for us, this minimal left ideal is an N group of type zero. And so we have a natural source, how to find N groups of type zero, basically in an arbitrary zero symmetric nearing with some finiteness condition. No, this is basically here, this is a generalized finiteness condition, so to say. Okay. Let's uh, jump into the proof. I think the time still allows it to do it. And first, uh, when we want to show that uh, we have an N group of type zero, we need to show uh, that we have a generator. And how do we do that? We have non-zero multiplication. And so there must be an element here giving product non-zero L times big L, capital L times small L is non-zero. Now, here is an important point. Minimality of L as the left ideal implies that this intersection is zero. Why is this the case? Uh, I have pointed it out quickly in the introduction, but these 
annihilators, they are always left ideals of the nearing. And since L is itself a left ideal, the intersection is also a left ideal and by minimality and the condition that we have non-zero multiplication here, we must have that this intersection is zero. What does this mean? This means that this map here, which turns out to be an, an n-homomorphism, this means that this map is an injective map because this here precisely describes the kernel of this map. Okay, which means that this map Psi L is a surjective n-homomorphism between these two structures, which means that they, this L and this L times L, they are n-isomorphic. They are n-isomorphic n-groups, both are n-groups. And by our assumption, they must be equal. We do not have n-isomorphic n-subgroups and the one is sitting properly inside the other. And so we have to found the generator. And what is more, this minimal left ideal contains an idempotent, I call it E, and it turns out to be a right identity in this left ideal. And how do we see this? It's also straightforward to, to see. We have some element E such time that E times L equals L. This comes from this property. Okay. Now multiply from the left hand side E times L equals EL clear and then use subtract it to the left hand side use the here the right distributive variable. Okay. E square minus E times L is zero which means that this structure is zero because we have zero intersection here. And this already shows us that this E is an idempotent. Now let's take some arbitrary element from the left ideal and now multiply it on the left hand side. And we find this equation, again, the same arguments here uh, show that this is in this intersection here, L times E, and since L times E is non-zero, here, the minimality we again have this one. Okay, which means that J equals G I G J E, and E is a multiplicative right identity. What does this multiplicative right identity bring us? It brings us what is called a so-called Pierce decomposition of the whole nearing n, namely as direct sum of the annihilator. Here I have a line break, sorry for that, of the annihilator E plus direct sum here n times E. But this n times E now is the left ideal L because E is the right identity in L. Okay, and now we want to show that the left ideal is an n group of type zero. What does this mean? This means that there shouldn't be any non trivial n ideals contained in L. And suppose we have an n ideal, I have the abbreviation I here for the n ideal. And what we want to show now is that this. Uh, N ideal I uh, is uh, also a left ideal of the nearing, which then by minimality forces that I either is zero or L, which proves that L is an N group of type zero. Okay, how to do this? First of all, uh, an ideal means that I plus is a normal subgroup of L plus. That's the definition of uh, an ideal. But now we have this direct decomposition. And if we have a normal subgroup in L and a direct composition of N as two normal subgroups, then standard group theory implies that I plus is also normal in N plus. 
No, that's good for you. Okay. So suppose we have two elements n m from the nearing. Okay. Now our Pierce decomposition allows us to decompose the element m as a plus l. A comes from the annihilator of E. L is an element in L. Okay. And now we consider this expression n times n plus i minus n. And what do we want to show? Uh, we want to show uh, that this expression is contained in capital I which then precisely means that this capital I is a left ideal of the nearing because this is the condition for, an, for a substructure to be a left ideal in the nearing. It has to be a normal subgroup, which it is, and this has to be a left ideal in the nearing. Now, basically, what do we do here? I think you, yeah, well, I'll try to figure it out within time. So we write this m as a plus l here, and then we can uh, set, we consider uh, this first expression here, and set the brackets differently, as the objectivity law with respect to plus, and here, this element here is an element of the left ideal L, which means that this sum here, oh, not really, it doesn't mean that, but we have uh, forgotten to mention this, that a direct sum decomposition of a nearing into two left ideals is called it is distributive, which means that N distributes from the left hand side in that way. because A is an element of the left ideal, the annihilator, and L plus I is an element of L. Note that N does not distribute over this bracket here. Yeah. We, we do not have a left distributivity law in general, but N distributes again over this bracket because A and L, they stem from two different left ideals with zero intersection. And now we will write this whole expression here in that way. It's easy to see that this looks like that. And now we have that I is an N ideal. That's our assumption, which allows us to say that this expression is in I. And since we have that I plus is a normal subgroup, we also have that this expression is in I. And we finally have that I is a left ideal of the nearing. I know it may be may have been a little bit quick, but if you want to have my lecture notes, you can have them if you really want to re reread this proof. And by minimality of this left ideal, we either have I is zero or I is L, and which shows us that the left ideal does not contain any non-trivial N ideal, which turns the left ideal into an N group of type zero. Now, we need another result uh, to support my talk. And this result, uh, is a result due to Stuart Scott. It can be found in Günther's Blue Bible. And I, I mean, I have put a proof here with references to Günther's book, but I don't think we need to jump into it. What does it say? Uh, it holds for nearings with DCCN and tells us that if you have a minimal ideal of the nearing, which does not have zero multiplication, 
then each minimal left ideal, which is contained in this ideal, also doesn't have zero multiplication. Yeah? Or conversely, if you have a minimal left ideal, which has zero multiplication and sits within a minimal ideal, then this minimal ideal also has zero multiplication. Of course, as you feel already, this is a strong result and it's a strong proof also, quite a lengthy proof. You can find it in Günther's book here. This is the reference number three, 55 or end proposition 53. Uh, here we have the DCCN and I have tried to rewrite Stuart Scott's proof in a more general way without using the DCCN, but as far as up to today, I couldn't succeed. Uh, the proof as it is given in Günther's book really requires the DCCN and not some weaker finiteness condition. Uh, which would help to produce more general results. So now we arrive at our first theorem, and this is the theorem which I already announced before. Namely, this is what tells us that uh, zero primitive nearings, uh, when considering nearings with DCCN, are exactly the subdirectly irreducible nearings where the non trivial minimal ideal has non-zero multiplication. And this is, of course, something which justifies studying zero primitive nearings in their own right, because we all know the famous theorem of Birkhoff, which tells us that any algebra is a subdirect product of subdirectly irreducible algebras. Of course, this uh, holds for nearings now. Any nearing is a subdirect product of subdirectly irreducible nearings. And the uh, subdirectly irreducible nearings, at least in the nearings with the finiteness condition here, they turn out to be precisely the zero primitive nearings, with the extra assumption that the minimal ideal has non zero multiplication. Of course, you might have a nearing and the subdirect decomposition of the nearing where the subdirectly irreducible components have a minimal ideal with zero multiplication. Structure concerning these nearings uh, is not known to me. I don't know. Yeah. But in case we have non-zero multiplication, these components uh, zero primitive. So what's the proof here? One to two has already been shown. Now we have two to one. Suppose we have uh, um, a subdirectly irreducible nearing with minimal ideal L. From the lemma here above, we know that each minimal left ideal contained in H is non nil potent. In fact, it's L square is not zero. Okay, we take some of it, and since it's non zero, we must have that H is not contained in the annihilator of L because note that L is taken from the minimal ideal here. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that the annihilator of L must be zero because H is the non-trivial minimal ideal. It would sit in any other ideal which is non-zero. So L is faithful, and the lemma we, the lengthy lemma we proved before with the Pierce decomposition tells us that L is an N group of type zero, which shows that N acts zero primitively on this minimal ideal. Okay. So this is one, this was the first theorem in this lecture. Now we will move on and I will prove another lemma. Uh, namely, uh, 
we want to produce certain non-zero ideals in an earring, provided we have minimal left ideal with non-zero multiplication in the earring. Okay. And here I need a notation or I've introduced a notation to make the proof a little bit easier in, in typing. The left ideal is always an N group in a zero symmetric nearing, and here we use the definition as its usual theta L0. This is the set of the non generators of the N group or of the left ideal, and theta 1L here is the set of generators. Okay. So the next ideal goes like this. We have an arbitrary zero symmetric nearing L a minimal left ideal. We suppose that L has this generalized finiteness condition, which holds especially if the nearing has DCCN or if it's, it's a finite structure. Then we find that this left ideal sits in the annihilator of all the non-generators. In other words, each non-generator of the left ideal uh, is killed by the left ideal itself, so to say. Yeah. Whenever we have a non-generator and the left ideal, L times this non-generator uh, is zero. And what is more important for us, this structure is not only a left ideal, but it is an ideal in the nearing. Okay, which contains L. So let's look at this proof. Uh, as an annihilator, I've mentioned it in the introduction, this is a left ideal of N. Now to prove that this is an ideal is straightforward. Take any non-generator of this left ideal and an element N from N. Then we see the following. N times N times L is contained in capital N L, it's clear, but this is again not L because L is not the generator, which tells us that this is also not a generator. Okay, arbitrary element N here. Now let's take some element from the gener from the annihilator, some N in N and some L in L here. Then A times N times L is zero because NL is a non generator and A is taken from this annihilator. What does this mean? This means that this is an ideal because what do we want from an ideal? Any element A multiplied from the right hand side with an N, it also should stay within this substructure, which it does here. Okay, so we, has, we have already established that this is an ideal and it remains to show, and this is the interesting part here, of course, that the uh, left ideal itself sits inside this ideal, which then turns this ideal into a non-zero ideal. So take a non-generator here. What does this mean? This means that n times L does not equal L. And we suppose now that L times L is uh, non-zero. But then by minimality, L is a minimal left ideal, remember. This means that L cannot be contained uh, in, in the annihilator and here. This is the, the statement. The intersection of L with the annihilator is again a left ideal contained in L, and by minimality, this implies that this intersection is zero. And you might remember this argument is precisely the same argument we used before in the lemma proving that certain left ideals are in groups of type zero. This map then is an injective map. Clearly, it's surjective between L and L times L, and this means that these structures are n isomorphic n groups. And by our assumption, we have that n isomorphic n groups, L times L being contained 
in L, here we have it. It has, it follows that L times is L times L. What does this mean? If L equals N times L, then we also must have that L equals N times L, clearly. But then this means that L is a generator of L. But we have chosen L to be a non-generator. Okay, it's a contradiction here, which tells us that for all non-generators, we indeed have that the left ideal itself kills the non-generators. And here we have a tool to produce non-zero ideals in the nearing. Okay, which is of course an interesting tool. Note that of course this ideal could be the whole nearing. I do not claim that this is a, a non-trivial ideal. I only claim that this is a non-zero ideal. Something different. Uh, for example, easy to see, let n be a ring and L a minimal left ideal in n. Okay. Let L be such that it is a non-generator of this ring left ideal now. And L is a left ideal in the ring. Yeah, yeah. Clear the left ideals in the ring look like that. Yeah. Now, since L is chosen to be a minimal left ideal of the ring, the minimality force is that n times L is zero. Which means that for rings, we always have that these ideals I have described here, they are trivial ideals. That's the whole, the whole ring, of course. Yeah. So these new rings, they are only of interest in in new rings and not in rings. Also, I haven't point, I haven't made this point here. You can do it as an exercise. If this L. If this L happens to be an N group of type two and the nearing has an identity element, it's easy to see that in such a case, also we have that this ideal is the whole nearing. So these ideals basically are only interesting when studying left ideals, which are indeed only of type zero and not of type two, for example. Okay, so these ideals showing up as annihilators of n group of type zero, the minimal left ideal, they play a prominent role when describing the structure of zero primitive nearings more closely, or when studying the structure of minimal ideals in nearings. And this is the next section in my talk. I want to mention or address a few results in this line of discussion. Uh, these are results as far as I can tell, which uh, from from myself. Uh, and yeah, in this section, I do not want to give proofs. I just want to point out the major ideas which can be done in this direction. So. First definition, uh, as usual, theta one is the set of generators of an n group, and theta zero is the set of non generators of the n group. We have just used the same notation only with the capital L before because we were discussing the left elements. Now, here we have a theorem uh, on zero primitive nearings without proof. It appeared in some paper some years ago. Uh, if you have a zero symmetric nearing with TCCN, which is zero primitive, then we already know, I have proved it beforehand, we already know that this uh, zero primitive nearing is subdirectly irreducible. But here we can go a little bit further, we can determine uh, what is the minimal ideal in this zero primitive nearing? It turns out that the, that the minimal ideal in this zero primitive nearing is precisely uh, the ideal of all the 
annihilators of the non generators of the n group of type zero. Moreover, it turns out that this minimal ideal contains a right identity element, which then can nicely be used again to get a pierce decomposition or decomposition of the nearing in two left ideals in that way. So the nearing, the primitive, the zero primitive nearing has a direct sum decomposition into two left ideals and here nicely one left ideal. In fact, it is even an ideal. It's the minimal ideal of the nearing is there. Are the annihilators of the non-generators and the other left ideal is the other annihilators of the generators. And indeed, this is only a left ideal. Cannot be an ideal because this would contradict the subdirect irreducibility of the nearing. What also uh, falls out here of the theorem, I haven't put it here, if this blue left ideal here is zero, which can be, then the nearing n equals the set of all the annihilators of the non-generators, which rewriting, uh, rewrite this, uh, this as the nearing acts strongly monogenic on the n group gamma, which means the nearing is one primitive. Yeah. So the difference between zero primitive and one primitive is precisely this left ideal here. This, mm -hmm. the, the annihilators of the generators here. Okay, what can we further derive from the facts we have proven so far. Here, I have one proposition, 573. Uh, this time it's not Günther's book, but it's Giovanni Ferrero's book on nearings. Uh, and this book of Giovanni Ferrero is a great source when uh, looking for properties of ideals or of prime ideals and whatsoever, you can find a lot uh, in Giovanni Ferrero's book. And here we have a result which is not from Giovanni Ferrero, but it is from Birkenmeier and Heberly. I haven't put the reverence here. And it says the following. Uh, if you have given a minimal ideal in a nearing which has not zero multiplication, then this quotient nearing is a subdirectly irreducible nearing. And the hard here, this hard means that the non trivial minimal ideal of this nearing is isomorphic to I itself. Basically, comes from the fact that the intersection I with its own annihilator uh, is non zero because I is minimal. What does this tell us? In case we have that N is, has DCCN, then also this nearing has DCCN. And this tells us, we have just proven it, that this is a zero primitive nearing. What does this mean? That the minimal ideals, uh, uh, well, not, not what does this mean? We have just seen that the minimal ideals in zero primitive nearings are the minimal ideals of the type killing any non-generator. Okay. So what does this mean? This tells us that basically all minimal ideals with non-zero multiplication in nearings with DCCN show up, up to isomorphism, as ideals of this type in a zero primitive nearing. They must be of this type. This means when we have a, a minimal ideal, there must be some n-group around and some non-generators such that this ideal basically is this uh, annihilator ideals. What can we do with this information? We can do something. I want to point something out in this direction. So let's look at ring theory. It is well known in ring theory, or at least it is known, that if we have a minimal ideal in a ring, 
then either this minimal ideal has a zero multiplication, I square zero, or it is a simple ring. This is a consequence of the so-called Andronakievich lemma in rings, and you find it again in Ferriero's book, Turing 571, or you have to look it up somewhere in the internet. Now, this is different to near rings. In near rings, indeed, we have examples of non nil potent or minimal ideals with non zero multiplication, which are not simple as sub near rings. This can happen in, in near rings, but usually they are not so easy to construct or used to be not so easy to construct, put it that way, maybe. The first example, at least to my knowledge, was an example given by Kale Kali. And you also find this example presented in Giovanni Ferrero's book, number 572. I do not deeply discuss the, the details here, but I only want to point out how this relates to our theorem uh, on zero primitive nearings. Uh, it is the nearing of that type we have the cyclic group of order eight. And within the cyclic group of order eight, we have a subgroup of the even numbers. And we take functions which map this subgroup into that subgroup, but that's not all. We also require that these functions commute with the multiplication in set eight, with cyclic group with five. This is a so-called centralized nearing. Professor Batch will introduce them, I think, in one of the next lectures. So I do not go too deeply into here. Why do we take five here? Yes, we take five because five, the multiplication with five is an automorphism of this group, but it's not a fixed point free automorphism on this group in contrary, in contrast to the fixed point free automorphism group Mr. Batch was discussing in the last lecture. Now, it turns out, without proof here, do not have time to do that, that this is zero primitive on set eight. I mean, this is an N subgroup, but it's not an N ideal. It's straightforward to calculate. Yeah? And now, from our theorem, this one, uh, I mean, in this example, it's a small example, you can also calculate it by hand, but we know that the annihilator of the non generators, this is the unique minimal ideal in the nearing. This means that this here is the heart of the nearing or the unique minimal ideal in this nearing. Okay, it's a minimal ideal. And it's not simple because there's another subgroup here, the multiples of four, so to say zero four. It turns out that this is an I ideal of set eight. Uh, I don't want to make it too complicated here. I is this here. And then in such a case, this structure, it takes the elements in I, all these elements in I, which I x naturally on the group set eight again, and all these elements of I, which are mapping into this I ideal, or you can write it as a Noetherian quotient in that way, maybe this uh, is a, for a more familiar notation for you. This is an ideal of I, but not of N. It's an ideal of I basically because U is an I ideal, but not an N ideal of set eight. Yes. So this is an example of a minimal ideal in a nearing which is not simple. And as far as I know, it's not only the first example of such a minimal ideal, but it is also of interest because the nearing has an identity element and an abelian addition. Now, what have I done? This is only a pointing towards, towards some results of mine. Using ideals of this form in a zero primitive nearing here, 
you now can systematically study structure of minimal ideals because we just construct zero primitive nearings. This is not so hard using nearings of functions or using centralized nearings. One can produce further interesting examples. For example, you can produce minimal ideals, which are not simple. You already had that, but also not subdirectly irreducible. So there indeed exist minimal ideals in even finite serosymmetric nearings, which are not subdirect irreducible as subnearing. Of course, in this line of discussion, it is of interest. Can there can one some can something be said about this question when are minimal ideals in a nearing simple? We know from rings that this is always the case, or the minimal ideal has zero multiplication. What about nearings? I have shown up with this theorem. Uh, just want to point it out as, out as an example. If you have a zero symmetric nearing with chain condition on n subgroups, and suppose we have a minimal ideal with non zero multiplication, then this nearing is a simple nearing precisely if and only if the so called Jacobson radical of the ideal. The Jacobson zero radical of the ideal sits within the Jacobson radical of type zero of the nearing n. Now, this is a pointing towards future lectures of Professor Betch. These are the so called Jacobson radicals of type zero of the sub nearing i and n, respectively. These are to be defined in a future lecture by Professor Betch. Basically, they are intersections of what we call zero primitive ideals in the subnearing I and in the nearing N. What is interesting here for us, just to point it out, I think I'm not too deeply into radical theory, but I think this condition is called ideal hereditariness of an idea of a, of a radical. This is naturally fulfilled in case N is a ring which reproves, so to say, this Andrew Nakevich lemma, but here in the setting of DCCN earrings, or it is also naturally fulfilled, and this is a result due to Kali Kali, as far as I know, uh, if the earring is distributively generated. Professor Betch uh, mentioned the, this property last lecture, for example, distributively generated, you may take a group, and the nearing of all endomorphisms of this group and generate the, the nearing. This is a distributively generated nearing. This result that the minimal ideal in a distributively generated nearing either has a zero multiplication or a simple. This result is explicitly due to Kali Kali. I know that. And here, this is a more generalized version, which yeah, shows up from studying ideals of this type here. Yeah. Okay, so this was the middle section. And we now come to the final of this lecture. I do not want to discuss further results without being proved now. We return to results which we are able to prove here. Again, we take our idea from a well-known theorem in rings. Uh, before the lecture, I was trying to find a reference for it, but was unable to do it here at home. I do not have uh, uh, too many books here. But if you have a ring and the ring contains a minimal left ideal, and we suppose that the ring is simple, then the ring is primitive, or it has the ring has zero multiplication. Uh, I think you can find it in Lamb's book on, on rings or in Rowan's book on rings. It's somewhere, yeah, but I do not have the reference here. Now, uh, 
the result concerning simple rings with a minimal I left ideal can be extended to near rings in the following way. This theorem looks like this, and we are able to prove it. Let's have a zero symmetric nearing, which is simple. This means that it doesn't have any non trivial uh, ideal. We now assume, and this is an assumption we have to take in addition, that the minimal left ideal exists in the nearing, which has non zero multiplication. Then you're already familiar with this condition. This is a generalized finiteness condition. This minimal left ideal should not contain proper n subgroups which are n isomorphic to the minimal left ideal itself. In case we have such a situation, then the nearing n turns out to be a one primitive nearing which acts one primitively on L. What is new here? We already know from our lemma proved before that L is an n group of type zero. So it is clear that uh, the nearing uh, acts zero primitively on L, but we have to show that it also acts one primitively on L. That's the next step to go for. So that's this statement here. Okay. So we have to show that the nearing acts strongly monogenic on L. What does this mean? Just to remember, this means that each non generator take a non generator of the left ideal and we want that the whole nearing kills the non generator so it always gives the product zero with respect to the non generator now we can use our lemma of producing ideals here we really have to use it so lemma 2.7 produces a non zero ideal of n Namely, we know that this left ideal sits in this ideal. This was the statement of the lemma. Yeah. Maybe since it's important here, we call it. Where do we have it here? Here we have the statement. We need it here. Yeah. Okay, so. Now, we have a non zero ideal, and of course, by simplicity of n, this implies that this is the whole nearing. And we are already done, because this tells us that for any non generator, n times l is zero, which precisely is the that's, that what we need for make turning l into an n group of type 1. We have to prove faithfulness. Suppose here we have a non zero annihilator, then this is a non zero ideal of n. By simplicity, this must be the whole nearing n, which contradicts L as zero multiplication. So n acts faithfully on L, and n is an angle of type 1, which makes the nearing one primitive. So we are already running into the end of the lecture. Don't be scared. Uh, we can improve the results of theorem, this theorem, when we switch to nearings with DCCN. There's another theorem here. Suppose we have a nearing with DCCN, which is a simple nearing, and we assume that the nearing doesn't have zero multiplication. Then it turns out that N is a one primitive nearing acting one primitively on some minimal left ideal of n. Uh, again, I'm not sure in how far this is an original result. It could be that this uh, observation concerning the DCCM nearings was already obtained by Kali Kali. I'm not entirely sure about that, but just I don't claim it to be original. How do we prove that? By the DCCN, we have the existence of a minimal ideal L. And because of simplicity, we have that N is minimal of an ideal. And now we have this lemma by Scott. I mentioned it before. 
in case we have a minimal ideal, which doesn't have zero multiplication, and we have DCCN. We can be sure that the minimal ideal doesn't have zero multiplication. This is something I couldn't use here in this theorem. Here I had to use this assumption because the nearing was not required to have DCCN. With the DCCN, I get this assumption naturally. Okay, and also to the DCCN, L cannot contain N groups which are anisomorphic to L. And of course, these are precisely the assumptions of the theorem here above. Yeah. And we get that the nearing acts one primitively on the left ideal. Okay. For DCC endings, simple DCC endings with non zero multiplication are one primitive endings. Now, here is a little thing which, to my opinion, is interesting. The action of the one primitive action of the nearing is an action on a minimal left ideal. It is not an action on a minimal n subgroup. We required the DCCN, we needed the DCCN to apply Scott's result. Therefore, I've mentioned before, it could be interesting to generalize Scott results on minimal ideal to more general structures. And here I've come up with an interesting example. I think it's interesting because it's an example of a planar nearing, and the planar nearing. The planar nearings, they have been discussed by Professor Betch in connection with block designs and also as generalization of near fields. And I have a multiplic multiplication table for you of this nearing. We have the cyclic group of order nine and a multiplication as follows. Remember, I use right nearings. What does this mean? The multiplication with four, I can mark this the multiplication with four. You see it, you have to consider the column, not the row here, the column. And the column, as you see, gives an automorphism of the, the group. In fact, a fixed point free automorphism. Multiplication with four, multiplication with five is just the identity map. This is a planarneering. The rest of the elements are so called zero multipliers. You know this from Professor Betch lectures. Yeah, here. You. Actually, this group is the group. At identity map minus identity map on this nearing. Okay, this is not of importance for us. For us, interesting is the following. Obviously, this is the only subgroup of M plus, and in fact, it's an N subgroup because multiplication from the left hand side. You see it here. If you multiply with three, if you multiply with six, this always gives zero and it stays within the subgroup. So it's an N subgroup, but it is not a left ideal of the nearing. For example, take the number one, take this expression. One plus three is four, one times four is, we have to look it up is eight, is eight. Yeah. One times one is zero. So this is eight and this is not in U. This tells us that U is not a left ideal. Okay. So from that, we see that N itself is an N group of type one because the action is clearly strongly monogenic on N. Each non-generator is only the zero multiplication there are no n ideals in this n group. There are no left ideals. 
No? And this shows us that n acts wrong primitively on n, but not on u. No? So the wrong primitive action is indeed on the left ideal, which in this case is the whole nearing, but it's not a wrong primitive action on the minimal n subgroup. And there's one thing to say further, I've put it here, n is a simple nearing. Uh, precisely the structure we were talking about, why is it a simple nearing? The only possible substructure is this subgroup U, which is not even a left ideal, so it cannot be an ideal, clearly. Yeah, and so we see in this example a simple nearing, which uh, is finite even, but the one primitive action is not on the N subgroup, it is on the left ideal. So we have come to the end of the lecture and here's the final statement. I should have put it here as a theorem, but I have forgotten to put it. One primitive nearings with DCCL, the chain condition on left ideals, is a little, is a little bit more general than the N on M subgroups. They are known to be simple. This is a result from Professor Betch and you can find it in Günther's book. On the other hand, we have seen here that if we have a simple nearing, of course we have to use the non-zero, we have that the nearing multiplication is non-zero, then we have that it is one primitive. And so we have a very satisfactory result at the end. We get that in case of zero symmetric nearing with DCCN, the Simple nearings without zero multiplication, should have put it here, are precisely the one primitive nearings. There is one uh, lack uh, of completeness here, which makes the whole theory much more complicated. These one primitive nearings or these simple nearings, they usually do not have an identity element, which means that we cannot describe them as two primitive nearings and thus, thus as centralized nearings with fixed point free automorphism groups, which would have been nice, but this is not available here. Uh, note that we had two major results here. The one thing is the subdirectly irreducible nearings in case of DCCN, they are the zero primitive nearings and the simple nearings if this is and they are the one primitive nearings. Okay, what about the structure of one primitive nearings? There are structure results available. In case the one primitive nearings, I should note it, uh, if in case the one primitive nearing has an identity element, it is already a two primitive nearing. But if not, then uh, yeah, we cannot use this famous density theorem to due to Professor Betch. But there is there are some uh, papers available on one primitive nearings and structure of one primitive nearings, describing them as sandwich nearings or centralized sandwich nearings. There is a paper by Günther Pilz and Peter Fuchs in that direction. There is also a paper or, or of myself in that direction. Okay. So this is the end of my lecture references here. They are not complete. This one is Giovanni Ferrero's book. This one is Günther's book. This is a uh, paper of myself with the result on the simplicity of the minimal ideal and the structure of the zero primitive nearing decomposing into the two left ideals, one the, gen the annihilator of the non-generators and the other one the annihilator of the generators. So that's the end of my story, and I think the time is, yeah, I think it's good. It's five minutes past three. So if there are any questions or comments, you have opportunity now. Otherwise, I can say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and to present some of my ideas. Uh, what can be done with uh, primitive nearings besides the two primitive nearings.
Oh, again, uh, thank you very much for this uh, talk. It shows impressively uh, what was done in the past years in this area. And uh, uh, I'm really impressed uh, on, on this results. Uh, may I ask you, in Theorem 2.6, you showed mm -hmm. that um, uh, zero primitive nearings are basically uh, uh, subdirectly irreducible nearings. Yes. Uh, so uh, since uh, of my Birkhoff's result, uh, one uh, gets the question, since every nearing is uh, a subdirect sum of subdirect irreducible nearings, uh, in, uh, can one also say that every nearing is the subdirect product of zero primitive nearings? Because there's still the question if the heart is zero multiplication or not. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. mm, I, uh, because uh, that would really be sensational because it uh, shows that zero symmetric nearings are the, in some way, the building blocks for all nearings. Zero. So, so uh, you, what, what, what was your point now? Again, I think I missed something here. The probably. point is uh, yeah. every nearing is a subject yes. product of okay. some very irreducible one. Yes, yeah. Uh, can one also say uh, that every nearing is the subject product of zero primitive nearings? Uh, okay, now I and with, with uh, zero multiplication here, yeah. just a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, every nearing is susceptible. Well, uh, doesn't it follow it? No. But at least we have to use the DCCN condition. Yes, okay, yeah. Every nearing is subdirect product, I have to note it because maybe I have to think about it of zero primitive nearings. And it's just a problem with the subdirect irreducible components uh, yeah. a, a good heart. So uh, yeah. the heart which is has no zero multiplication. Yeah. The problem is maybe that this subdirect, uh, this, this hearts of the subdirect irreducible nearings, they are not simple. This could bring some trouble here, maybe. But um, yeah. Now, if you have each nearing is a subdirect irreducible, no, it's a subdirect product of subdirectly irreducible nearings. That's the Birkhoff theorem. Okay. But on the other hand, if you take a subdirect, yeah, since the subdirect irreducible nearings are already, I mean, isn't that, that already the theorem here? If the subdirect irreducible components are zero primitive or have zero multiplication, mm -hmm. Doesn't that already tell that that any nearing with DCCN is a subdirect product of zero primitive nearings or nearings having zero multiplication? Isn't it that? Yeah, I think. I mean, I the problem is we, we are doing, from that, yeah. I think it should be. I mean, the, the problem is uh, that how to describe the 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 subdirectly irreducible nearings where the, the minimal ideal is zero multiplication. Yeah. I think this is, there is, I do not know anything about that. Mm -hmm. How do they look like, you know, and so on. And also it opens the problem, uh, which uh, nearings are subdirectly your uh, subdirect products of primitive nearings, zero yeah. primitive nearings. Of course, uh, yeah. If you can yes, say, uh, 
Yes, that's that's a that's another question. Mm -hmm. So if the so so to say, which earrings do not have these subdirect irreducible components with zero multiplication? What are yeah. these earrings? Yeah, this is a good question. I don't know. No. Mm -hmm. I note it here on my sheet of paper. Maybe I have time to think about that. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, if not, then. Uh, I thank you very much uh, for giving this lecture and it uh, contained uh, uh, a number of, of strong results. Thank you very much, Knut. It was, it was a great pleasure for me to, to see you. Uh, it's a long time that we right, uh, yeah. saw each other. Long time. Also, also Mr. Petsch, of course, and all the other ones here. I, do not know, but I'm very happy that uh, it's obviously there is an interest in hearing theory and an interest in doing yeah, studies in hearings, which makes me very happy also to see some younger people here, which is really nice, I think. So if you have questions to me, which you do not want to pose here at the moment, just you know, just write me an email. I can also send you papers of mine, whatever you want. Okay. okay, so then thanks a lot. And the next lecture will be not following the following Monday. Uh, it's Monday uh, in one week. Uh, and this is by Gerhard Petsch again. So see so, you again in June. See you. See you again. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.